Welcome back to Anton Math. Now this is going to be our last video on parametric equations and we're going to talk about something that sometimes comes up uh, with parametric equations and that is modeling circular motion. So for example what we're doing is we're modeling the motion of an object around a circle or we're mar uh, another way to put it is we're modeling the position of a circle at a given point in time. So this could be a spinning bicycle wheel, it be could be a cog turning in a machine, um, it could be something moving on the outside of a circular space. Uh, so the way that we do that is we're going to describe the path of the object given by um, the equations that I don't have up here yet, the parametric equations, by stating the radius of the circle the object is traveling in, the initial position of the object, and when we say initial position we mean the position at t equals zero. This usually corresponds to the beginning of the time frame considered, so when time equals zero. Our orientation of motion, so we're going around the circle clockwise or counterclockwise, and the time t it takes to make one full revolution of the circle. So let's take a look at a few examples of this. We'll start with an easy one. Let's say my parametric equations are x equals three cosine t, y equals 3 sine t. Now the way that I can figure out what this circle is is we can use our Pythagorean identity. I know that for a circle I want to look at x squared plus y squared and in this case my x is 3 cosine t so I have 3 cosine t squared plus my y is 3 sine t so 3 sine t squared. This is equal to 9 cosine squared t plus 9 sine squared t distributing through that square. I'm going to factor out this 9 so this is 9 cosine squared t plus sine squared t. This cosine squared t and sine squared t is just 1 from my Pythagorean identity so this is equal to 9. So we have a circle then and we've answered the first part of the question I have a circle with radius 3. Okay. Now the initial position, the initial position is going to be the position of the object when t equals 0. So this is just um, my x value is 3 cosine t, so my x value in initial position is 3 cosine of 0. And my y value at initial position is 3 sine 0. Now cosine of 0 is 1, so my x position is 3, and sine of 0 is 0, so my initial position for y is 0. So if I drew out this circle that we're talking about, and let me make that straight line. If I draw out this circle that we're talking about, this is a circle of radius 9, or sorry, of radius 3, excuse me, the circle of radius 3 and when t equals 0 I'm starting at this point right here 3 0. Now as t increases I start moving around the circle. Now this one's fairly straightforward because we're used to 3 cosine t and 3 sine t and in fact when we first talked about cosine and sine in terms of real numbers we defined it as the x and y position as t moves around the circle. So here if I'm going around this circle I want to know how long does it take for me to do a full revolution and get back to where I begin but that's going to be the same as the period of these two trig functions. My cosine doesn't fully repeat itself until t goes from 0 to 2 pi, does it? And the same thing with sine. So my time t for one revolution is 2 pi and my orientation here is going to be counterclockwise c c w because well, let me do it this way. Uh, if I look at cosine of t, or maybe I should do it this way, as t increases, x, which is equal to 3 cosine of t, is going to decrease, right? When t equals 0, x equals 3, and as t goes up around the circle, I know that my x goes down, right? And that's the same for cosine in general. Right, I'm going around this circle this way, and maybe I shouldn't write that t is going around the circle. And the best way to look at it is um, as t goes from 0 and increases, what's happening to x? Now a common mistake here is that some students will say, well, I'm going to plug in, 
let's say pi or maybe pi over 2 or something like that and they say well if I plug in pi over 2 and it's somewhere over here that means I must be going in a counterclockwise direction but we'll see sometimes you could plug in pi over 2 and maybe when t goes from 0 to pi over 2 my motion actually goes all the way around this way so plugging in a random point and and hoping that it's closer to your initial side because that's the direction you're moving isn't really a great way to go about this we want to look specifically when t increases just a very small amount what's happening to x and y now here in this case again as t increases a very small amount sine is starting at zero as t increases a little bit sine is becoming positive so y is going to be increasing in other words because x is decreasing I'm moving to the left and because y is increasing I'm moving up so that's going to give us a counterclockwise direction now it may seem confusing what the difficulty is here because I chose an example where x is associated with cosine and y is associated with sine so I want to do another example where that's not the case and let me get rid of this one now in this example we have x is equal to sine 3t and y is equal to cosine 3t so we have some more stuff going on that we're not used to first of all we usually have x with cosine and y with sine don't we uh, just in our definition of sine and cosine that's what we're used to seeing and that's why the last example was so easy now we're gonna have to be a little bit more in creative trying to figure out what this is gonna be so let me pull up my little answer boxes here now first I want to find the radius of this circle so let's figure out what this circle is x squared plus y squared this is going to be sine squared of 3t plus cosine squared of 3t now remember having a 3t in the argument doesn't change my Pythagorean identity so this is equal to 1 I have sine squared plus cosine squared so here I have a circle of radius 1 my initial position this is going to be at x when t equals 0 so that's sine of 3 0 and my y value here when t equals 0 is cosine of 3 0 or in other words just 0 for both of these now sine of 0 is 0 and cosine of 0 is 1 so my initial position is 0 1 let's take a look at this let's graph this out we're looking at a circle with radius 1 my initial position is up here at 0 1 okay so this is where I'm starting in the last problem we started where we usually start with the unit circle so it made it kind of easy here we're starting in a different place it's gonna mix things up a little bit so when I look at my orientation what I need to say is as t increases what happens to sine of t right as t increases from 0 well sine starting at 0 and a t that's just a little bit more positive than 0 in my unit circle is in quadrant 1 so sine's going to become positive which means x is increasing from 0 to a positive number now y is cosine cosine of 0 is 1 and as t increases a little bit on my unit circle cosine decreases so my y is actually going down so writing this on my unit circle my x is increasing so I'm moving in this direction my y is decreasing so I'm moving in this direction so we see I'm moving in a clockwise direction I'm going in this direction along the circle I'm going to the right and down so here we have something different than the last problem where we're actually moving in a clockwise direction now time t for one revolution that's gonna be the amount of time t it takes to get back to my initial point now that's the same thing as saying what is the period of sine 3t and cosine 3t we know the period for both of these functions is 2 pi over 3 isn't it this is my 2 pi over k way back when we were graphing those functions so in other words as t changes from 2 pi or sorry from 0 to 2 pi over 3 I'm going through one entire period with my x and y and then I'm starting over 
So my time for one revolution is 2 pi over 3. Now this isn't a surefire check to the answer, but if we ever want to make sure we're on the right track, you know, there's going to be lots of answers that make it this way. We want to make sure it's the smallest such answer. But x at 2 pi over 3 is sine of 3 times 2 pi over 3, which is 2 pi. So this is 0. And y at 2 at when t is 2 pi over 3 is going to be cosine of 3 times 2 pi over 3, which is again 2 pi and this is equal to 1. So I know I'm back at my initial position. The only thing we want to make sure is that there's not a smaller value of t at which I'll be back at my initial position. But if we're dealing with sine and cosine functions that have the same argument with respect to t, all we need to do is figure out what the period is of those functions. That's how long it takes us to get back to the position in which we started. If you remember all our discussions about period way back in chapter 5. All right, now that's it for parametric equations. In the next chapter, we're going to start looking at vectors. We'll see you there.